Well, you know what Emily Dickinson said, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. You know, success in circuit lies. In any case, um, it's, uh, we don't usually quote Dickinson in journalism, but that's all right. We'll just work out that. So you're a kid here, and, and basically it seemed to me, if I, as I read the book, that you were living a, sort of a typical American kid's life, urban setting. Um, and somehow you managed to uh, advance through some grades, in fact, break out of the neighborhood, and you went to... Uh, within a very short time, you're accepted into the most prestigious high school in the city. How did this happen? Well, uh, first of all, how it happened is uh, because America is a great country. I went to an elementary school where there were no programs for non-English speaking kids. There was no, I don't know that it was another non-English speaking kid in the whole uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning school. And, but the teachers, without any special qualification or training, saw who I was and what I needed, watched me carefully. When they saw I acquired skill in language, that they could move me up, they moved me up. And I made the rapids in junior high, that, that picked up some speed. Uh, and so uh, it was their attention, their kindness, their thoughtfulness. There was no government instruction for this, there was no program. That just came out of their decency and their skill. And I'm so, my, when I reflect on it, I am so much impressed, and I am so much impressed by my memories of how they impressed me when I was young. How they dressed, how they behaved, how, it, how they established the, the, the relationship between teacher and, and pupil. Uh, these are things that we have remained with me all my life, for my betterment, I must say. Well, you know, uh, it's, I'm intrigued. You wrote your first newspaper story in eighth grade as a, uh, as a school newspaper, I note. Um, and then you, there's something that you glide by quite quickly. In 1947, I won a current affairs contest sponsored by Time Magazine. First prize was a book selection. And you explained the book you chose. But I'm interested in how a kid so recently off the boat from Germany developed so quickly this interest in, in current affairs, uh, well, an extraordinary I, interest. I think that's natural. We, I grew up during World War II. I grew up as a ref, refugee kid. And we were interested in the war. I mean, not just me as a refugee, but all my, all my friends were. We followed the battle fields. We knew the names of strange, strange places all over the world. And, and we were current. We would talk about it. And, um, and so it, it, was, it would have been unnatural to have been oblivious to it. I mean, this, this was a great undertaking. It absorbed the entire country. We were all with it, with one way or another. I mean, our, our, our physical lives were impacted with the brownouts and the blackouts. And I became an air raid warden messenger. And, and uh, all of that, that was, that was the stuff of our lives. How could we not? How could we not be concerned with the world and, and, what, and America's role in it? And well, very natural. And, and though the choice to become a journalist, you had to argue with your family when you came to be a senior in high school. You wanted to go to college to, to study journalism. What made you so determined that journalism was the right choice? Well, it started, uh, that, that reference to your eighth grade. Right? In the eighth grade, we were in junior high school, and someone decided that our class, not the whole grade, our class would publish a weekly newspaper, a mimeograph sheet, and different people got different assignments, and I, I became the foreign editor, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, one of the issues uh, was, was, a, was a presentation uh, of uh, where should the second front take place? It was a discussion, and different people made different recommendations. There was, you know, the Normandy, there was this, there was that. I actually had the better plan. My plan was that it should take place in Norway. We should take on Norway, get there, bring Sweden into war on our side, and then hit directly into Germany rather than having to go through France or the lowlands. Now, if Eisenhower had listened to me, <laughs> we would have shortened the war, we would have reduced casualties. But the tragedy is nobody listens to a kid in junior high. <laughs> All right, if there are any junior hires here, you quote that, that back my, to your parents. That was there my you exposure. go. 
Anyway, so the summer after high school, you get your first real newspaper job, your first job at the Herald Tribune, where you then stayed for 18 years after that, or even 18 longer? 18 years. Yeah. If you, well, I, I, I interrupted my service first with, by going to college, but I, would, I was hired every summer to work during my summer vacation. And then after I got a college, then the Korean War broke out, which our chancellor told us on our freshman convocation that before you graduate, there will be another war. And we thought, boy, he's a real downer, you know. <laughs> there well before we graduated. Well, we were in the middle of our, of our uh, college careers in 1950. The Korean War broke out. I got a college deferment. But that ended when I graduated from college. And I went off uh, to the Army. And the Army decided to make me a clerk typist and decided that those skills were most important in Korea. And so I went there, and I wound up in the military history section of a higher headquarters that wrote command reports that would then be sent to the Pentagon. And in some future date, they would be integrated by a historian as the factual basis of what the historian would say about the Korean War. I began there as a clerk typist. But I got type, bored clerking and typing. And so I bothered people. And I had a very excellent commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel, Haskell. Colonel Francis Haskell, mm -hmm. a gentleman and a scholar in both meanings of the word. And I began to write parts of the report. I got a secret clearance. And I did this throughout my Army career. And so this wasn't really another form. It's not journalism, but it is writing. It is taking facts. It's making sure that the facts are correct. And it's making sure that it is told in a way that a person sitting in Washington 20 years after you had written the words can understand them and doesn't have to go piling through the original documents to you know, find out what you meant to say. Of course, I have to point out that you also write that you became the editor of the newspaper on the troop ship coming back primarily because you could avoid cleanup detail that yes. way. OK, so this is, this is there are many You, you think this is an unimportant thing. <laughs> <laughs> you have never detail. been on cleanup detail on a troop ship. <laughs> Only at home, that's true. You probably have never slept on a troop ship. I have not, this is Another true. Another reason for being the editor is that you could sleep in the, in the editorial offices on a metal bench. You took your, your life-saving belt and used it as a pillow, and it was damn more comfortable than sleeping with your nose two inches from somebody else's rear end. Excellent. There are many things that go into making a career. Here we go. So out of, uh, out of NYU, we should give uh, uh, kudos, by the way, the, the unnamed uh, undergraduate institution was Syracuse University. Um, out, uh, out of the Army, uh, back in 1954, you go back to the Herald Tribune. And at one point, you thought maybe you'd take a reporting job, and somebody convinced you not to. Why is that? I wanted the job because I was very unhappy with the man. I was then working at the news service, the Herald Tribune News Service, which was a supplementary news service where the Herald Tribune sold the, the, its excellent work to other papers throughout the country and even overseas. And uh, it, was, it was a good job, but it wasn't on the paper. You know, you didn't see your work except as it comes bouncing back. And it was editing. I wanted to be a reporter. And so I went to Luke Carroll, the city editor. And I, my, my incumbent boss at that time and I did not get along. And, and I thought I should try to get out from under. And I went to see Luke, and I asked him for a job. Well, he was good enough to speak to me. But he said, get out of here. Um, <laughs> A good editor is more, uh, reporters are a dime a dozen, but good editors are hard to find. That was the first time everybody said to me I was a good editor. And that was very important to me. Well, it wasn't the first time, but first time somebody of his stature said that to me. That was very important. And, and your career progressed. We'll slip through some of the Herald Tribune years pretty quickly, though. The, the standards you uh, worked under there were obviously very high. One of the things that struck me, though, in reading this uh, throughout the book is how hard you worked during your career. 
Um, and there are kind of two sides to that coin. Would you like to describe the uh, date April the 11th, 1964? You remember that day, Annie? Mm -hmm. What happened on April the 11th, 1964, and what did you do? Is that the day that the Stephanie? Andrea Doria? No. No? Well, I don't know what happened. Was... <laughs> that was uh, your third daughter's birthday. Oh, my God. <laughs> you let me walk into that? <laughs> Where were you? You were going to give me signals and stuff. <laughs> Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> After 60 years? I am shocked. <laughs> oh, well, oh, I just see the hard work, right. Well, Steffi was born, and it was a Saturday, mm -hmm. and my, my saintly mother-in-law came to uh, babysit the two girls, and I came to visit Annie at St. Peter's Hospital in New Brunswick, and my new daughter, and I, we had a very nice visit, as I remember. <laughs> uh, then I went out, I bought a box of cigars, and went to work at the Herald Tribune, because we had a Sunday paper to put together. <laughs> I know, I should be ashamed of this, but I wasn't at the time. I was devoted to the newspaper, I was devoted to trying to keep it alive, and I think that was characteristic of the people who worked for it. And, we, and they did, I would say, shameful things like that. Uh, and I, I, I am, uh, when I retired, I told Paul Grandal, who wrote the retirement story, that the thing that I regretted, especially from those days at the Herald Tribune and the Washington Post, was that I was neglectful of my family. I spent a lot of time in the office. Six days was routine, seven days was not unknown, hours were long. At the Herald Tribune, we were fighting to keep the paper alive. At the Washington Post, we were fighting to make the paper a first class paper. It took a lot of energy and a lot of hard work. I learned hard work by watching my father work. He was a very hard worker. And I also learned hard work from Keith Spaulding, who was the editor at the Herald Tribune News Service when I first became exposed to it. And he was a very hard worker. And from them, I learned that you want to solve a problem, you put some time into it. You'll solve the problem. Eventually, the Herald Tribune didn't make it. In 1966, it folded into a pair of other newspapers. And you briefly went to work for Columbia University uh, doing public relations work. Um, you know, we have, uh, we refer to ourselves in this business as hacks, and there are flacks. Uh, so uh, you went from being a hack to being a flack. Did that give you any different perspective on people uh, working in uh, public relations? Well, I, I, I saw what they did, and I, I learned to respect what they did. My, my I had not done any, really any reporting as an editor. I did some. Um, but here, I, I was basically a reporter, but a reporter with a pres prescribed mission. It was to put the best face of Columbia University forward to the world. So I went to find stories, programs, activities. I wrote about them honestly and fully, but uncritically. And these were sent out, and they got pretty widespread use in the paper, so I saw how, how the I saw firsthand how the game was played. I played it for money. It wasn't much money, but it kept body and soul together when we were out of money, because the Herald Tribune was constantly on strike, and we were constantly running out of the, the few hundred dollars of savings we had. And and uh, it was time to find a real job. We hope with a future. So in uh, 1966, September 66, you go to the Washington Post. You've, I'd like you to talk about a couple of people there. You've described Ben Bradley, who's become legendary uh, through the movie and through his writing. And of course, he was uh, very famous just uh, by his work alone. What do you think about the way that Ben Bradley led the newsroom of the Post? Well, Ben Bradley is a great editor. And Ben Bradley, I say with Catherine Graham's backing, made that newspaper great. All honor and tribute to Ben Bradley. 
I don't agree with all his methods, but I didn't mind working under his methods. Creative tension, for example, which he denies he ever even knew the meaning of. But it was to put departments and department heads in competition with each other, and out of that competition would come a spirit and a drive that would result in a better newspaper. It did. But in the process, some very good people who could not accommodate themselves to this kind of tension. I mean very good people. They just didn't want to work in that kind of atmosphere. It was pretty tough. And, and uh, they went on, and some of them to very distinguished careers. And John Katz is a name that some of you journalists might recognize. He went, I, I, want, I want to hold him by the heels for him not to leave, but he left. And there were others, like what Aaron Latham went on, but he went on to bigger and better, and there was no way for, for me to keep him from doing that. He wrote Urban Cowboy. You might remember the movie. And, the, and he became a, a great magazine writer and a writer. And th these were just terrible losses. But we always managed to hire new people, including Bob Woodward. Uh, uh, but there were other uh, distinguished people that came on board. And, and, uh, but there was a lot of blood on the floor. And when I came to Albany, I was determined not to manage that way. And that, that I would not, maybe to my fault, maybe to my fault, maybe I should have gone halfway that way. But I, I decided, no, that wasn't my way. And I also decided if I was going to have a managing editor, and I turned out to have three at the, at the, at the paper, they would be managing editors. They would manage. And, and I wouldn't just, they weren't just figureheads, as often they became under Ben Bradley. But Gene Patterson, a distinguished American newspaper editor, Pulitzer Prize winner, left after three years saying, Bradley needs a managing editor like a boar needs tits. <laughs> he was his own managing yes. editor. So tell us also about uh, someone who throughout this book you describe in rather, in really with such great respect, and that's Catherine Graham. Tell oh, us about indeed. your relationship with Mrs. Graham. Well, uh, uh, Mrs. Graham is a, a great lady. Uh, she made key decisions at a time when she was under great pressure. Her husband had died. She had only been at the fringes of the business, although it was her father's uh, company. He bought it in the middle 30s. And her, her husband took it to some level, in my opinion, not a terribly impressive level. What was known, what was admired about the Washington Post was the quality of its editorial page. I knew the Washington Post because the Washington Post editorial page was well esteemed. Also, Mrs. Graham's mother, Agnes Meyer, was a, was a distinguished public woman. And she spoke out frequently on, on really controversial issues in a very liberal way. And she was impressive. And one knew about the Post because of Agnes Meyer. So Catherine Graham had a lot going for her. And she. I came to learn over the years, and especially when the, the, she got around to writing her own stunning autobiography. If you not have, have not read that, I urge you to read it. And we had a long talk that day and, mm -hmm. in 1991, and she nicely provided me with a transcript of our conversation. And there's a good chunk of that in the book. Uh, and she described how she felt at sea. She didn't know where to turn because the people she was trying to manage were people that she had grown up with who knew that she didn't know in her own words. And she knew they knew. And she felt at, at and, but she knew somehow she wanted, needed to make a change. But she didn't have the courage to do so until Walter Lippmann, a close personal friend of the Graham family, also a close personal friend of Ben Bradley, uh, managed to facilitate that by basically firing the resident managing editor, Al Friendly, and getting uh, Bradley to come in first as assistant managing editor and then taking over from Friendly. 
And when she put Bradley into place, she said she learned a lot. She learned that when she had done that, there was a different relationship between the owner or the publisher and the editor than there had been when she came in as the now grown daughter of a little kid that they all saw, you know, in, in whatever little kids wore. Uh, uh, and this empowered her. And she saw that she was listened to. She wanted to be listened to. She didn't expect to be obeyed. And she, if Bradley didn't agree with what she said, he didn't do it. But he listened to her. And then she took some actions that she was sorry for going around Bradley. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you, it was a brilliant combination. Would that all newspapers had that kind of dedication with that kind of people? Because you cannot have a great newspaper. You cannot do great journalism unless you have the person in charge, the person who's worried about the budget, who's willing to risk the budget, willing to risk profits in order to do it. Because often, when you do the great journalism, you run up against entrenched interests that can do you real harm. The Nixon administration, for what? But there are many lower level kinds of challenges that every newspaper publisher faces, every newspaper publisher faces. And they each face that challenge. During Watergate, what was the threat that hung over the Washington Post company uh, that, that Kay Graham had to face up to? Well, the, the immediate threat was that the Post owned uh, television stations which were licensed by the federal government. There were explicit threats by the uh, by the Nixon people, for one, uh, John Mitchell, who famously said that Catherine would get a body part caught in the ringer, and they would do a number on us. And that number, of course, would be that they would take away these very profitable licenses. She did that. Number two, during the Pentagon Papers, which occurred the year before Watergate, there was a furious battle whether the Post would publish the Pentagon Papers, because the New York Times had broken the story. They had had the papers for months, I think six months, or something like that. <coughs> and they were able to go over them and study them and whatnot. And then the US District Court said, you've got to cease publication while we adjudicate whether, as charged by the Nixon administrations, national security was being endangered. After the Times was stopped, the Post acquired through Ben Bagdikian, the national editor, a version of the papers, not all of them, from the man who had leaked the papers in the first place to the Times. And, and, we, and we then had days to go through them, make sure that we wouldn't violate national security and that we had a coherent story. Days in place of months. And then the battle became, in the face of the US District Court order that the Times ceased publication, the lawyers said this would be a triple violation, a more dangerous violation for the Post, because it would publish in the face of that existing order. In addition, the Post had gone public, and the financial advisors all were against it. The lawyers all were against it. The editors, I was not part of that group. I was the Metro editor. The national editor and, and the managing editor and, and the key writers all were, were for publishing. And she was under the pressure. On the one hand, her respected lawyers and financial advisors, very important to her. And on the other hand, the people who were running her paper and were making the paper, the quality paper it was becoming, and she made that awesome decision. And once she had made that, it became much easier. She changed lawyers after that, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, once she did that, it became much easier in Watergate to stand up to the incessant barrage that came from the Republican Party and the Republican establishment, and the indifference of the vast numbers of the American public. Even the hostility. Why are you doing this? 
What's new about this? They all do this. It takes real guts. It takes real courage. Speaking of lawyers, while we're, let's just jump ahead a little bit to Watergate. I learned from reading your book that the Post first learned of the Watergate break-in in a phone call from the newspaper's lawyer, Joe Califano, who was also general counsel to the Democratic Party. That's right. That sounds like a very close relationship that I wouldn't have expected at that point. Well, I think that was very typical of Washington. I mean, the, the preceding law firm that had been dismissed was William Rogers' law firm. <laughs> he was wrapped up with the government. You know, he was Secretary of State and things, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Uh, um, yes, it's a conflict. And there were times when I, I had a legal issue that needed explicating where I couldn't use the Washington law firm because they were all tied up with their, you know. And so I used the lawyer for Newsweek, which was owned by the Washington Post, but he was in New York, and he had nothing to do with any of these people. And on the phone, he gave me the advice that I needed to deal with a very, very delicate matter. And uh, we had to do this. But is it a conflict? Yes, it's a conflict. Is it, did we worry about it? No. Ben Bradley's best friend, as far as I know, in Washington was Edward Bennett Williams, who was the head of that firm. Well, was there a man more connected in Washington than Edward Bennett Williams? And he used to say to Bradley and drove him up the wall, What's with all these anonymous sources? What is this? Why don't we know the names of these people? And that's what drives Bradley Wilder. It wasn't the Republicans saying it. It was Bennett Williams saying it. Interesting. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit uh, in the interest of time. Uh, through Harry's time as foreign editor, uh, his being named assistant managing editor for Metro, heading the local reporting staff. And we're moving into this era of Watergate. And I just want to give you a name of one of the people who worked for you and tell me, uh, because the name that I bet nobody here has ever heard of, Gene Baczynski. Nobody here, I'll bet, has ever heard of Gene Baczynski. I think that his role in Watergate's reporting was absolutely fundamental. Tell me what Gene Baczynski did. Absolutely. Meant. Gene Baczynski uh, worked in the cop shop, and he was a police reporter. And on the Sunday, the break-in was on Friday night. They gathered the stuff on Saturday. Either Saturday on Sunday, he's at the cop shop, and, a, and an officer that he knows lets him look at some of the material that was taken from the burglars. I think from Bernard Barker's attaché case, but I'm not quite certain of that. He, he, he took an address book, and he looked through it, he leafed through it, and he found the notation E. Hunt, W. Dot House, and he did not, did not overlook it. He seized on it, and he brought it to our attention. And on the following day, Woodward tracked E. Hunt to uh, Hunt. What was his name? E. Howard Hunt, right? E. Howard Hunt Jr. and and made the connection that he frequently called. Uh, Colson, who was the special counsel to Nixon. And already we had something. Because at the hearing on Saturday in court, James McCord is talking to the judge. And he's trying to tell the judge that he's CIA and go right on me, you know. <laughs> and, and, and Woodward hears this. And we confirm on Sunday that indeed he had been CIA and that he was security person for the committee to reelect the president. So we're already getting information here that is telling us we have a very, very good story on it. <laughs> that doesn't mean we thought the president would resign or anything near that. We had, for Metro, an uh, excellent story. We hadn't had such a good story since they tried to assassinate George Wallace, you know. It, it, no, no.